introduction uh, uh, about the way religion has really affected security and, uh, and the cohabitation on the continent. Uh, hence the reason why we have this topic today is to help us understand what has been going on in Africa as regards religious fundamentalism and religious freedom. So today we have two amazing um, guests to help us decipher this, this uh, problem. Uh, first is Dr. Kolani Sakuba. Uh, he is a lecturer in the School of Religion, Philosophy, and Classics uh, in the Department of Biblical and Historical Studies at the University of KwaZulu Natal. And notable among his works uh, is uh, Fundamentalism in African Traditional Religion, a reflection on some points for consideration. Uh, Dr. Sakuba's areas of research and expertise include sy uh, systematic uh, theology. Theology purely and Christian theology. Uh, welcome, Dr. Sakuba. Thank you. Sure. And uh, also among us is uh, Kefas Lamak, who is a pre comprehensive candidate and a lecturer in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Iowa. So when we say pre comp, it's, it means uh, you're almost becoming a doctor very, very soon. I just need to pass uh, one, one or two exams. Uh, he is the recipient of an ASMIA research grant for his paper on religion or violence in the name of Allah, the rise of an Islamist extremist group in Northern Nigeria in the 2000s, and the threat he poses to civility, freedom, and democracy. Uh, Lamarck's expertise, research, and teaching interests cut across modern uh, religion and culture. African culture and religious practices, uh, religiously affiliated conflicts and resolution. Welcome, uh, Professor Slamak. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. I, I will just jump straight into it. Uh, but before we do that, I will part uh, uh, of the conversation uh, by first dropping your questions in the chat uh, function, and, um, and we'll be sure to bring them to the table. Uh, that's the one way to be part of the conversation. And another way, you can, you can also um, put comments and add your suggestion uh, to ongoing uh, thread of, of conversation. So I want us to start off. Uh, I, I was looking at uh, a, uh, a tw is it 20, 2008 to 20, 2018 study by Pew, PW Center for, um, for is it social, social research? But it, it was a research done by Pew and it was about the most religious countries in the world. And of course, you can guess the most religious countries are in Africa. And uh, the least religious countries are in in northern in, in Western Europe and uh, some part of uh, Middle East. In fact, Israel is about 36%, when, for example, Nigeria is about 88%. Uh, so in other words, the people that brought Abrahamic religion to the continent are... Uh, and uh, I guess that won't surprise too many people. But I want to understand... If you can kindly start us off, uh, Professor Sakuba, uh, to tell us what is the borderline between a religion and a fundamentalist religion? When does a religion become fundamentalist and extremist uh, in contrast to a pure, a pure religion, a tolerant religion, if there is anything such, such as that? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I still hope that I am, my, my, I am audible. And I would like to apologize for the quality of the of the video. I, I I don't know what is going on. It is not usually like this. So let me just go get straight to to your question. And and thank you for that for that well crafted question. Um, it is also a very a very a, a complex question in the in the sense that. Um, when you think about religion, to, to be able to, to explain when does religion begin and then when does fundamentalism, or what is the difference between, between fundamentalism and religion, look, here is how I'm going to, to, to explain it. Religion, by its very nature, is a source of fundamental truths. 
In other words, in religion, this is where human beings derive certain fundamental truths about reality in general. So religion is a configuration of theories about reality. So these theories about reality, which religion provides for human beings, covers a wide range of, of areas. For an example, in the religion, religion um, uh, covers epistemology, which is theories relating to, to what is true, to what is false. Religion provides theories that, that uh, touches on the issues of ontology, uh, theories about reality. It, it covers uh, the area that touches on cosmology, the universe. But most importantly, religion also touches on issues of, 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 of ethics as well as aesthetics. Ethics, aesthetics. Um, another area, a theoretical area that religion covers is the one of, of axiology. In other words, the theory of values. So all of, the, all of these theories together form a body of truth. They all together form a body of, of truth. Now, truth, religious truth, is by its nature propositional. It is, it is propositional truth. As we know that there is a scientific truth or fact-based truths. And then there are there's, there's a religious truths, which is mainly, mainly uh, founded on, on, on propositions, which religious leaders put out there persuasively so that there may be adherence to religion. So at what point then does it become, become fundamentalist, right? Uh, fundamentalism, in my view, kicks in as soon as there is an invested interest in, the, in, in protecting those fundamental truths. So fundamentalism, by its nature, is human willingness or human tendency to want to, to preserve or to, desert or, or, to, or, or to defend certain fundamental truths about their, the teachings, doctrines that emanate from their religious traditions. So fundamentalism is quite, is quite complex. Religious fundamentalism, I must also say, because fundamentalism is not only limited to religion. There are other explorations of fundamentalism that, that transcend religious traditions, but religious fundamentalism in particular has got to do with the adherence of, that, of a particular religion being willing to defend the certain fundamentals within that particular religious tradition and not willing to, 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 to shift. So one could also say that uh, fun religious fundamentalism takes the form of the unwillingness to, to modernize as well as the unwillingness to reform. Mm -hmm. so, so religious fundamentalism takes the form of, of, of conservatism, which, is, which emanates from human willingness to conserve, to conserve certain, certain truths which they, they think are quite sacrosanct within that particular religious tradition. Mm. I think that's really brilliant. And if I get what you're trying to say, it's that religion itself is an adherence to a body of truths. And defending that truth makes um, that religion becomes fundamental or fundamentalist. Uh, so I want to ask, um, Kefas, why is fundamentalism in itself dangerous? And I don't want to. I don't want to use the word extremist here. I, I don't know if you guys think fundamentalism also means extremism. But let's stay with fundamentalism. Why does fundamentalism becomes dangerous, Kefas? Yeah, thank you so much for that um, wonderful question. Um, you think about 
uh, religious fundamentalism today, it has uh, different faces. Uh, so you might also say that um, it is a form of extremism, uh, depending on um, the way you see it and the uh, religion you are looking at. So I wanna say that um, religious fundamentalism has different faces. Um, it can be different with uh, Christians, um, with conservatives, with uh, uh, progressive, and um, with Islam also, and with different sectarians, um, it is taking different shapes. For instance, um, David Tidestar wrote an article on religious fundamentalism in South Africa. And he is saying that it is even very difficult for you to have a precise definition of what uh, fundamentalism is, right? Yes, fundamentalism has some roots to uh, you know, reality or truth uh, or ethics or um, even morality, so to say, yeah. uh, this attempt of going back to basic yeah. teachings of a certain religion, right? Uh, for Christians, when they talk about fundamentalism, for instance, from its emergence uh, here in the West, uh, they, they go back to this idea of uh, five teachings, basic teachings of, uh, you know, Christians, right? They talk about the virgin birth. They talk about the inerrancy of scriptures. Uh, they talk about the resurrection, uh, you know, the, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. They talk about, um, you know, atonement of sin. So they talk about these five basic uh, teachings of, uh, you know, uh, Christian, Christians. And the same thing with Islam. When they talk about uh, fundamentalism, they try to go back to early teachings of Prophet Muhammad, right? Uh, they try to a kind of um, align what they are fighting for, what they're standing uh, for with the teachings of Muhammad. But then, like you rightly said, it is becoming problematic today because people take it to that extreme level, right? With uh, Christians, there is this idea of we have the truth and you have to follow our own truth uh, uh, even within the Christian dom. So you see fundamentalism, uh, you know, going the other way in different Christian traditions. And with Muslims, it is the same thing. Um, they kind of hold on to we have the truth. And before you know what clashes begin to come in, um, you know, uh, between those traditions, people take it to the extreme, I will say. Uh, that is why it becomes a problem uh, to some extent. But if we don't take it to the extreme, um, it, it has some level of truth, uh, so to say, yeah. Okay, so I think we're getting into some, uh, some understanding here. So first we know that religion itself is a form of adherence to, to a body of truth that mm -hmm. you know, um, defending those truths itself is normal and that could be fundamentalism itself, and fundamentalism can become dangerous when it clashes with other forms of fundamentalism. Then I want to know because I want us to be um, uh, to be um, conversant with reality here. Is calling somebody a fundamentalist? I mean, knowing that they have to defend their religion, is calling them fundamentalist in itself an intolerant attitude by us? I mean, if we see somebody with uh, with a complete veil. As, as a female Muslim, and they say they're not going to remove the bill, even if it threatens uh, national security. Uh, calling such person fundamentalist in itself, does it, uh, uh, does it um, evoke uh, an intolerance, intolerance attitude from, from us, uh, Dr. Um, Sakuba? Thank you very much. Um, that is a very interesting question. Um, to call someone a, a fundamentalist can be, can be an expression of, of, of intolerance, especially for if that utterance comes from someone who is not an insider to that, to that religion, to that religious tradition. But um, I think even more important is the, is the, is the fact that what is the genealogy of the term fundamentalist? In other words, what is the background of that term? 
Mm-hmm. So if you look at the background of, of, of who names who, in other words, whose who's, who's terminology is this, and uh, who, who, who has or who perceives him or herself as having the power to name, that is where the problem begins. So, mm-hmm. so who, who has the authority to identify a fundamentalist? And on what grounds does that person uh, apportions that responsibility or that power upon him or herself? So historically, we do know that the history of the very term fundamentalist goes back goes back to to um, uh, the post enlightenment period, mm-hmm. where where those who were who were in favor of of modernity were quite perturbed or they were quite um, intolerant uh, towards those who were, who, were, who were holding on to their religious beliefs and religious tra- traditions. So, so there is a negative connotation that, that analyzes the very term fundamentalist. So, and we also know that this is a term that is quite prevalent in the West. It is also a term that is quite prevalent in Western media, and 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 um, Western media and probably and and I, I dare say even Western scholars do use this term to to uh, as a form of category to to categorize a, a, a certain groups and to categorize certain religious tradition. For an example, um, it has become it, it has become a norm to only limit the term to to Islam, and people are not uh, as as ready to use the term fundamentalism to uh, in reference to Christianity, for an example. But the truth of the matter is, we do know that Christians can uh, can be can also be very fundamentalist. We do know that uh, the very term fundamentalist, fundamentalist itself is not only limited to religion. There are also scientific fundamentalists. There are also ideological fundamentalists. There are people who are, who are uh, Marxist fundamentalists. And they, they, even, even in scholarship, there is, there is scientific orthodoxy. So, so it can be a term that is quite derogatory it can also be a term that that is that is uh, targeted at certain groups and individuals. If you may allow me, um, a program director, uh, uh, I would also like to just go back a little bit to the question that you posed earlier to my colleague. The question about why is it that religion can can be can be so dangerous and and. Mm-hmm. To explain this question or to tackle this question quickly, I want to go back to the to to uh, to the issue of truth, right? And to look at truth. What is unique about religious religious truth? In my view, religious truths are by very nature conflictual. Religious truth are adversarial. They are judgmental, and they are condemnatory. They condemn. So, so fundamentalists judge, condemn, accuse, and religious truth, another, another, another component of religious truth is that they are remedial. So they are, uh, 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 religious truth are there, are there to remedy something that is, that is an opposite of, of, of truth. In other words, they are there to address untruth. So, a remedy by its very nature is violent. So, so a remedy is violent. If you, if you take antibiotics, when you have got a certain ailment, the, the purpose of taking that, those antibiotics is to actually kill some bacteria. So, so, an, so an antibiotic is actually violent towards the bacteria that it is meant to, to, to kill. So, so it is the very same thing with, with religious truths. They are, they are quite adversarial, uh, accusatorial. They are, there's an element of accusation and there is an element 
of, of, of judgment. So that is why religious truths, when taken to their logical conclusion, can be can be bounded. So, so this, this huge commitment to one's truth can ultimately be violent, and that is the reason. Oh, okay, brilliant. Uh, so just to summarize, it yeah. seems as though we also understand that uh, there are always going to be contrasting bodies of truths, depending on, on, on whatever uh, truths a religion is created for itself. So religion A truths may not necessarily be the same with religion B truths. And when those things are not the same, they often clash. And again, it will bring out the worst in, in, in both religions. Okay, good. Uh, but before we proceed, I was hoping we could go to a different segment of the, the webinar, but uh, it seems that we have um, some questions regarding this phase itself. Uh, just to remind people, uh, you, you can please um, drop your questions in the Q&A box. I will be sure to ask them. So we have two questions. From, first from uh, David Aditula, who is a writing fellow at African Liberty. Uh, David says, uh, uh, I want to know your views on what exactly the problem is. Do you think the problem lies in a religious person holding the belief of absolute truthfulness of his or our religion, or not being tolerant of other people's absoluteness of their truth? Uh, and he said he thinks these two different truths could exist in the different worlds of the orders of these truths. Uh, just give you, each of you like 30 seconds to, to react to that. Uh, you want to go first, uh, Plamak? Yeah, um, I don't mind going, uh, responding first. So yeah, if you think about religious fundamentalism um, and truth that we have been talking about, um, like David Chester would say, that sometimes one of the futures of religious fundamentalism will be that they can be reactive, they can be selective, they can be uh, absolutist, they can be dualist, they can be uh, millenarist um, in their expectation of uh, the eminent uh, uh, truth that they, they think of or they perceive to some extent. So going back to one of the questions you posed earlier on, when fundamentalism started uh, at post enlightenment period or as a reaction to uh, enlightenment, um, fundamentalists took pride in it eventually. And even today in some conservative cycle, um, like in Christianity, people take pride in being called fundamentalist because they see themselves as people who hold onto that truth of their religion. Uh, so you see that in Protestant Christianity a lot, uh, people, people thinking that we hold the truth and we are proud to defend it. But on the other side, you know, the society has a way of defining uh, fundamentalism um, because of the extent, you know, it went. Um, you know, when they say you are a fundamentalist, they are meaning that you are an extremist. Um, they are also meaning that you are reactive. They are also meaning that you are intolerant of uh, other religions. So I wanna say that there is no one way of you know, um, defining this. Um, it, it could be of pride to those who hold on to it, especially in Christianity, and it could be uh, derogatory uh, on the other side for the public um, in general, yeah. Right, uh, Dr. Sakuba, you have anything to add to that before we move on? Yeah, it, it, thank you very much. I look, I concur with my colleague. Um, look, the, the reality is not all fundamentalists are violent or extremists. That, mm -hmm. is, that is just, just the, the element of fundamentalism that that becomes problematic problematic is is when that fundamentalism is acted out right it's when it is a reaction mm -hmm. so 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 without the reaction i can be a fundamentalist who is tolerant mm -hmm. but the moment my fundamentalism is a reaction towards what I perceive to be sin, a sinful act, and then I've got, I see myself 
as having the responsibility to, to act, then that is a problem. If my fundamentalism is, is expressed as a, viol as, as a response to certain, to certain, uh, um, uh, to a human rights culture, for an example, the rights of women, the rights of the LGBTI communities, the rights of, of, of non-religious people and so on and so forth. Then that becomes a problem because now it, 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 uh, it extends to the person next to me. But if I hold dear to certain fundamentalist, to certain truths, which I think are absolute truths, and yet I am able to, to, to accommodate a different view from someone else, even though I know very well that I am not convinced by that view because I hold an absolute, I subscribe to an absolute truth. Then fundamentalism in that sense is not problematic. So I don't know if, if, if I'm making sense there. Yeah, it does make uh, a huge sense. And, and I guess, uh... <laughs> It's, I think for me, for now, to be about, it depends on whomever is looking at this. It, what, what's fundamental to you uh, could as well be um, an absolute nonsense to somebody else. And what's true to you would be an absolute rubbish to somebody else. So it's just about uh, being tolerant in the hand. So we, we do have still uh, like maybe four more questions on the, on the aspect of fundamentalism. And we have like two minutes before we move on to the next segment. Uh, I'm going to read this couple of questions and I hope you could please uh, answer them um, uh, jointly. Uh, so the first one is from Daniel Orogo who says, uh, uh, do we equate the conduct by the early missionaries to have deployed religious fundamentalism in their quest to conquer and colonize Africa? You're asking a question from, from, from my heart because uh, I mean, sometimes we don't regard those category of preachers to be fundamentalists. However, you look at um, the way they brought uh, Christianity and Islam into African spaces, and you want to think, are those, in fact, fundamentalists? So that's one question. And the second question I would like to first take together is this by Sulaiman Kamara, who says, do you think religious tolerance means to practice your religion along with other people's religion? OK, I think we're going to separate it. So maybe, Kepas, you, you please ask the, answer the first question about early missionaries and fundamentalism, maybe in a minute, please. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, you look at missionary activities um, around uh, Africa, um, to be precise, you see a lot of, uh, you know, denominations and um, groups bringing in uh, Christianity into um, uh, different parts of Africa uh, from the 18th century, immediately after the abolition of uh, slavery, right? So you see the CMS, you see the Dutch missionaries, uh, but even before then, I will say, if you go to like region, if you go back to history of um, Christianity in Congo and Angola from uh, 15th century, you know, uh, Catholic missionaries, um, the Jesuits have been uh, in those uh, regions. Yeah, so some of those missionaries, to be honest with you, that brought in Christianity, um, to Africa were fundamentalist and they kind of rooted uh, the idea of fundamentalism with different denominations that they planted in Africa. And that is why Africans still hold onto some of those beliefs that we have the truth, right? So with African Catholics, for instance, they have the tendency of holding onto what they inherited from their forefathers, going back to the times of missionaries. The same thing with Anglicans, right? Uh, you go to Equa, you go to uh, you know Sudan interior um, churches that were planted by missions. The same thing, you see those kind of traits. The same thing with uh, Islam, uh, for instance. Islam has been in Africa for a very long time. You go back to 7th century, down to 8th century, uh, when um, North Africans brought in Islam through trades and, and other these things. But then I also think that they did the same thing. They rooted this idea of fundamentalism in people. And that is why Africans still hold strong onto their various uh, religions, be it uh, Islam or Christianity. Yes, it has something to do with that to some extent. Yeah. 
Right. Okay. Uh, the question by Kamara, uh, Dr. Sakuba, do you want to please answer that? Do you think religious tolerance means to practice your religion along with other people's religion? Um, religious tolerance is quite is quite complex in practice. <laughs> it is it is quite complex in the in the sense that it is it is it, it calls um, the faithful to be to be to to pay the higher price, and the higher price comes in the sense that to be tolerant is to be able to coexist with within a space mm -hmm. where there is also an expression of that which you do not agree with. So this calls for a high moral standard. This calls for for um, this calls for the Jesus Christ like kind of an understanding. And and this is this is quite difficult for human beings to do. Now now here's another way of looking at tolerance. I I, I really like tolerance because tolerance is not an absence of of hate or tolerance is not an absence of is not an absence of, of disagreement. So what tolerance is in actual sense is that is that is that tolerance is, is accommodating, is recognizing that we are sharing the same space mm -hmm. with people who we do not see eye to eye with. We are sharing the same space with people whose religious values are contrary to those of ours. And yet it calls one to be able to recognize the dignity in the, in the, in, in, in the next person and the freedom of the next person to be able to, to, to practice or to see the world through his own worldview, his or her own worldview. So it is quite a complex, a, a, a phenomenon that that calls for the higher order kind of maturity mm -hmm. and 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 understanding it is not it is not about it is not about compromising your own faith it is not about compromising your own uh, uh, position on 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 reality on on the nature of god or the nature of your faith but it is about being ethical. So this brings in another, another dynamic here between being ethical and being moral, mm -hmm. you see? Uh, because, because on the one hand, to be ethical is to be much more open. In, in Christian theology, we talk of ecumenism. So, so within the, the framework of ecumenicity, you do find people of different faith traditions Sharing the same the same concerns, whether it's over poverty, whether it's over global warming, or eradicating human trafficking, for those for those people who are coming from different religious traditions to be able to to be part of an ecumenical community, they need to they need to de-amplify or to tone down on on the, on their core religious values in order to achieve a higher value. So, so it is quite complex. It, 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 the, the time that I have is not sufficient enough to, 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 to really articulate the complexity of, of, of tolerance. Uh, well said. Okay, uh, so at this point, I'll just admonish um, us to bring our questions from the comments box to the uh, Q&A box, because there's a lot of questions in the comment box that I cannot keep track of. So if you already posted your comments in the, uh, oh, sorry, your questions in the comment box, please paste them in the Q&A box so we can properly track them and, and ask them on the, on the table. Okay, now we move into another section of, of the conversation, which it took me a while before I, I, I could write this question down. So I have to think about it myself. So the question to, be, to, to try to put it simply, in a plural society, like Ghana, like South Africa, like Nigeria, where you have different religions, different category of people. The states in those society, what is its religion 
In other words, does the religion, I'm sorry, does the state have a religion? Of course, I know we talk about civil religion and whatnot, but if you look at the fact that the people who are leading us, uh, the president will average be in Africa, either be a Christian or a Muslim. And you have different other subscribers to other religion in the same country. And we've noticed that in certain cases, for example, in Nigeria, where you have uh, someone like Muhammad Buhari, who is a very, I mean, open, um, uh, strong defender of, of the religion of Islam, uh, a lot of Christians have questioned his judgment on certain key uh, uh, issues. So in other words, in a plural society, must the state have a religion? And if it should, what should it be? And if it shouldn't, uh, what then do we uh, uh, make of the state's uh, uh, religion? I hope that question isn't as complicated as I'm making it to be. Uh, you want to go first to the, uh, uh, Dr. Lamarck? Yeah, I don't mind. Uh, so that's a very good question. And I want us to always think about uh, pre-modern society versus a modern society, right? Uh, like in pre-modern society, um, you cannot separate religion from um, politics and governance, right? Uh, right from uh, the time of uh, uh, Homo sapiens, if, if you think about it, um, people practice religion and they never separated religion from the society. Uh, religion shaped everything they did, uh, you know, day-to-day uh, -day, uh, practices or life that they lived were shaped uh, basically by religion. But then you look at the West uh, from modern periods, right? Um, secularism and uh, uh, enlightenment uh, period, so to say religion became a problem for them where they had to separate you know state and religion at some point and so uh, in the west for instance religion is personalized um, you have to make religion very personal uh, personal you don't take religion to public uh, spaces uh, even as a president you want to keep anything that has to do with religion away from you. Um, you wanna focus on your politics and governance. So the a kind of separated religion from uh, uh, politics or from state. But then in Africa, I think people still hold on to this past idea, pretty more than idea of religion has to go with state, whether we like it or not. And that is where you see a whole president of a nation uh, seeing themselves as a representative of their religion. They wanna be biased. They wanna give appointments uh, to their people. Uh, they, they use religious rhetorics, uh, you know, in their politics a lot. Um, so how should it be? I don't know. I think if we wanna progress to some extent, um, like the West, where we, we wanna move forward, we have to make religion uh, very personal, right? Uh, religious toleration, may not take effects fully if religion is not you know being personalized people ought to personalize religion uh, politicians also have to make religion very personal than identifying with uh, one group or so so that is what i would think uh brilliant uh, before i get your response to Kusakuba on the same question of must the state have a religion i also want you to please uh tie in this question from jude Ayua, who is so uh, questioning why we always exclude African religions in conversation like this, because I mean, are they not being marginalized to you? Are they not being discriminated or called uh, fundamentalists in some sense? Uh, if you wanna please uh, merge that with your response to the, uh, the state's question. Okay, um, perhaps let me just tackle the, the, the second question about African traditional religion quickly. And my response to that would be, uh, I don't know if um, the person who's posing the question was here when I, when I started with my contribution. When I started with my contribution, I mentioned that, that um, um, fundamentalism is a human phenomenon. It is it is it is a phenomenon that 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 can be found universally to all human beings, and um, fundam religious fundamentalism in particular is also is also a phenomenon that can be found in all human religions, including 
traditional African religions. Mm -hmm. So traditional African uh, um, uh, adherence of traditional African religion can be fundamentalist, very much so. So, so it is um, in the paper that you, you, you referred to earlier that, that I penned quite a while back, I, I make that point quite clear. And, and, um, and you will see that that paper I presented before it was published, I presented it in a, in a conference where my colleagues in that conference were actually frowning upon what they thought was, was, was not, they thought that it was, it was they, their thinking was that fundamentalism can only obtain where there are sacred scriptures and and i was and i was quite surprised by that response i said no it, it, it can't be fundamentalism religious fundamentalism can be can be anywhere in fact you can even find some kind of fundamentalism isn't even in atheism so so uh, alistair mcgrath when he was responding to to uh, to Richard Dawkins, who was coming down on Christianity, um, Alistair McGrath uh, actually labeled Richard Dawkins as a atheist fundamentalist. In other words, mm -hmm. what he meant by that is that Rich, uh, uh, Richard Dawkins was holding on to certain fundamentalists of of atheism, despite overwhelming evidence that that mm -hmm. actually points to a different direction. So let me now move to 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 the second question about about um, uh, um, about uh, I would call it secularism. <laughs> I, th I think I think there's, uh, uh, my 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 colleague um, uh, st started quite well in 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 outlining the the difference between what is happening in the West. And what is happening in 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 Africa? Let me start with what quickly start with what is happening in the West. We all know that that uh, post post enlightenment in the West, we mm -hmm. saw this 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 uh, drive away from there was a, 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 a pendulum a shift away from religion because because of modernity and then and then uh, secular uh, the West became. Or, or thought that there would be a secular society uh, where religion had to be taken out of politics, religion had to be taken out of education, it had to be taken out of, of certain uh, sectors of the, of the society. But whilst that did happen, you still see in the West what I would call an unconscious bias towards Christianity, an unconscious bias towards Christianity, and this unconscious bias towards Christianity was not glaring until Islam made inroads in, into the West. So, so, so uh, before before the age of of, of um, terrorism, Islamic terrorism, Islamic extremism, and all of that, it is almost as if uh, Western societies had forgotten that they are Christians, and then and then uh, what we see with Islamophobia in the West is that is, we see the West saying we are a Western society and we are a Christian society. So the point that I'm trying to make is that even though religion is not, is not glaringly in the public uh, uh, discourses in the West, even though it is personalized, I concur with my colleague, it is personalized, but when it comes to, when it comes to, to right-wing politics, in the West, whether those right-wing politics are in, 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 in the Dutch society or whether it is, it is in Germany, all those right-wing leaders, they always fall back to Christianity. And we saw this with Donald Trump. When Donald Trump came into power, he came into power because he was a, able to rally the, uh, the, uh, the, ev the evangelists. In, in, in the United States who were saying they are Christians. So the 
quote unquote, most developed, West, most modern society in the world revealed <laughs> through Donald Trump that actually they are not as as uh, they are not as as uh, as modern after all they, they they do have religious sentiments in the closet but in africa these religious these religious uh, sentiments are out there for anyone to see but uh, lastly uh the the relationship that African politicians have with religion is quite complex. Remember in Africa, we, you said in the beginning that, that Africa is the most religious continent. If you're looking for, 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 for most Christians in the world, you will find them in Africa, which means that the church has the numbers and politicians are always looking for the numbers. If you want those numbers, you will find them in the church. So when it comes to voting, you do need to massage the egos of Christians so that Christians can be can, can actually do what Christians did for Donald Trump in America. So the, the relationship between African politicians and religion is um, the jury is still out on what exactly is the nature of that relationship? Mm. That's that's loaded. Uh, we, we are rapidly running out of time and I'm gonna read, read some comments then we are gonna use the rest of the time to take questions. So uh, we we have a comment here from Jibrin Yahya who says, in my view, in the modern democratic practice, states are separated from religion, but in a real sense, when a follower of one particular religion uh, clinch a position of power, he or she rules uh, with bias. But the real point I want to postulate here is that in running governance, those in power should respect the views and rights of all citizens in, uh, in respective of their allegiance, beliefs. Uh, this is the only way to join. Uh, this is the only way to go, rather. I'm the British from National Open University in Nigeria. Uh, there's also a comment from Charles Nkonge, who says, I followed African politics. And I consider all those who use religion and politics as dictators. Uh, they use it to the advantage in order to rule over others. No lie, my brother. Uh, I think there's also another comment from um, Jude Ajua, who says what Lamarck is saying about leaders taking their religion into politics, I think, is not unique to Africa. In certain countries in the Middle East, the state and religion are fused. In the US also, as um, Dr. Sam, uh, Sakuba said, and despite their secularism, certain presidents, such as Trump, have insisted on Christian nationalism. However, I appreciate the suggestions of politicians separating the two. And uh, lastly, from Oliver Mwangi, who says, I second Mr. Charles, religion should be separate from politics because politicians use it as a vehicle to rise to power. The current situation in Kenya is evidence we elected a Jesus only to find a bar bar Barnabas. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to leave the comments at that. Uh, so now we go to questions. And I hope we can have time to take this question, uh, all these questions. So the first is from uh, uh, Anonymous uh, Atebi, who says, do we define, how do we define truth since it is relative, as you both agree? Uh, do you agree that fundamentalism has some elements of differentiation? And this is from, uh, okay, they named themselves, Merit Ayibe. Uh, I don't know. Um, Lamar, could you please take exactly a minute to answer this question so we can take each question uh, with one minute uh, moving forward? Yeah, I think this person uh, came a little bit late, but earlier on we said that fundamentalism, just like the truth, and uh, that is very relative, fundamentalism too can be relative, right? Um, fundamentalism started, you know, differently in the 18th century, late 18th century. Uh, down to uh, 19th century and even today. At its start, um, people like in Christianity took pride um, in fundamentalism here in the West. And their idea of fundamentalism is to defend certain Christian truths or teachings, right? But today fundamentalism is taking different shapes. In some of my studies, I came to realize that there is, you know, uh, some elements of fundamentalism in Pentecostalism and even every tradition that uh, you can think of any religious tradition, 
uh, like uh, Dr. Sokoba was saying, even in African traditional religion, you see fundamentalism. And people understand fundamentalism differently. Somebody can be carrying an AK-47 and fighting you know, his fellow human being in the name of fundamentalism, right? But if you go back to what fundamentalism ought to be, it's supposed to be this sort of uh, uh, being an apologetic uh, towards your religion, standing to truth that you um, read or understand from um, you know, your various scriptures or even from practicing your religion if you're an African uh, indigenous uh, religious uh, practitioner. Yeah. Thank you. Uh in a moment, I, I would like to suggest if you two could please drop your Twitter um, handle for people who still have questions, because we're, we're not going to be able to take all these questions. Or uh, if you do not have a, a Twitter, maybe uh, if you're comfortable with an email address uh, in the chat box. So we move next to uh, Shalom Kasim, who says, uh, Dr. Sakuba mentioned in passing about the promotion of fundamentalism. Also, an explanation regards the view that the media for promoting fundamentalism also serve as a medium for curbing it. Uh, my question is, can these be metered or can it ever be a uh, one way phenomenon? Because my assumption is one once in the media for attacking fundamentalism and promoted a parallel existence nature is being immediately kicked off and vice versa. Okay, I, I don't seem to understand this question, but do you understand that question? I think it's uh, Talking about the media and um, fundamentalism, the role of the media perhaps in promoting or curbing uh, fundamentalism. You want to respond to that, Dr. Sakuba, in the means, please. Okay. L look, I also didn't quite get the question, but um, I think what the, what I'm getting out of it is that is that the media can be used, or let me say, those who are peddling fundamentalist ideas can actually use the media as a medium of communication to, uh, to, to spread their ideas. So we live in, in an age of, of, of social media where, where any message can be communicated into different media platforms. Uh, and then the question is, can that be kept? Can, can media houses, can Meter or can, can Twitter or Elon Musk come up with ways of making sure that they, 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 they uh, care that? I, I, think, I, I think that media houses, one of the things we need to understand about media houses is that, is that media is a multi-billion dollar uh, uh, industry. And and uh, owners of media houses are out there to make money, so so the the, the morals and the, and the ethics of, of 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 certain things sometimes media houses look away unless unless there could be um, a, a very strong uh, a lobbying from civil society to to make sure that that uh, such practices. Uh, 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 properly uh, 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 monitored, but uh, as we have seen with with uh, uh, within the American body politic, when when uh, uh, either uh, the Democrats or or, or um, uh, either the, the the Democrats or, or they are Republicans were using the media to 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 put their political ideas across. It is it is very difficult. It, it is very difficult in America. Fox News is is proudly can be proudly seen as a as a as a as a media house that that is openly uh, promoting certain fundamentalist thoughts and certain fundamentalist attitudes towards mm -hmm. towards um, the Islamic communities and towards towards migrants, where there is money. Um, there is always going to be a problem. So, mm. so, so, so that is that is um, uh, the biggest the biggest fear. So, I don't uh, know if I got that question quite quite correctly, but that is my take on it. All right. Uh, well, I, I think that's that explains it uh, uh, a lot. And um, I, I, major, majority of the fellows we have at African Liberty have been in the media or they are in the media. 
And my guess is that perhaps half of the attendees in this webinar have some relationship with the media in Africa. So uh, in the end, everybody has responsibilities and, I, and I'm very sure they are listening. So uh, we maybe can take this next question from, uh, okay, this one is just talking about the, the stoning to death of uh, Deborah in Nigeria earlier in the year. And of course, I think everybody will agree that's, that's, even, that's not, not only fundamentalism, that's extremism. Uh, but, but I think that's it. I think it's a valid question because I've listened to many analyses by Islamic clerics and you know critics of Islam, and people have said in the Islamic uh, liturgy, some aspect of the Quran and some aspect of the Hadith uh, actually recommend the treatment of stoning to death or killing of somebody that's um, uh, blaspheme against the Holy Prophet. So. I guess the question is, in cases where we need certain religious books or, 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 or practices uh, recommend such extremism, I really don't know what to make of it that honestly. Yeah, so I want to really stay careful about like generalizing for a, a particular religion, right? I want to say that in every religion, um, there is this extremist that we are talking about. There are people that believe you can depending on their interpretation, how they understand and what they choose, you know, from those scriptures and um, the way that they interpret them, either from the Quran or from the Hadiths. Uh, like we said, that one of the uh, futures of um, fundamentalists will be uh, very active, being, uh, you know, uh, arrogant and all of that. So, yes, if people want to justify most of their actions, they can do that. But then in the same Islam, you have people that are super peaceful, people that are sweet, people that are loving, people that are friendly, people that don't agree with, you know, those kind of interpretations. The same killing of Deborah, if you remember, you, you hear a lot of clerics coming out to say that is a no-no, that is not the form of Islam that we practice. So yes, uh, people can choose and pick what passages of scriptures they want to use to justify those killings. Even in the Bible, if you want to use just war theory um, to justify certain wars, you know, going on around the world in the past or even in the present, you can go to the Old Testament. You can, you can, you can pick scriptures to talk about uh, annihilating a community or killing a king or doing something uh, in the name of religion. So Augustine will propound this theory of just war, right? And in the past, people have used it as well. Uh, during the Crusades, people have used it as well. Though it is not common in Christianity now, but I want to say that people can choose and pick, you know, what to uh, uh, use in justifying some of their actions. Finally, I want to say that for our society, if people will go back, if they have been uh, true fundamentalist, just going back to the teachings of, you know, either the prophet or uh, Jesus Christ himself, uh, you will see that Jesus Christ lived with different religions, right? Jesus didn't live uh, in isolation, and he didn't undo Greco-Roman uh, uh, religions, uh, neither did he undo other ancient religions that were there before him. The same thing with Islam. Muhammad lived with diverse religions, right? He didn't leave, you know, uh, in isolation or by himself, you know, founding Islamic religion. So I think if people would think about that in relationship to their ideas of fundamentalism, that will go a long way. Our prophets, our God did not leave differently and they didn't do, they didn't undo past religion. So why should you kill someone like in the case of Devorah uh, in the name of your religion? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks for that insightful uh, uh, remark, Lamar. I, I wish we could take more, but we have a lot of questions we couldn't take, and I hope uh, uh, the audience will do well to um, follow up with um, questions to your uh, email or social media accounts. I'm sorry, Dr. Sakuba, I would have loved to hear a conclusion, but we're really out of time. And uh, I, I again want to thank you for such an insightful uh, conversation and uh, to our audience for asking the fantastic questions. I'm sorry we didn't take too much of that, sorry, most of them, uh, but I, I'm sure that uh, you've enjoyed the time as well. So we'll see you on the next one, uh, next month on African Liberty webinar. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your, uh, your 2022, frankly.